Hey guys, welcome! Here's my custom painted K2SO. Then with a few basic weathering steps, I've got him looking like this. Quite like him, eh? Looks great. My theme for this is a support droid for a hardworking stormtrooper team on Tatooine, scouting Mos Eisley, looking for a couple of lost droids. And today I'll take you through some of the processes I've used to have him looking like this, including dry brushing, chipping, and panel lining. Hey guys, Link here. I wanted to very quickly say thank you, thank you very much for supporting me on Patreon. You guys are making all of this content happen and I hope it's helping you and providing value for your hobby life. I want to do a very quick shout out to the new people who've joined the team. Philip, DK, uh, my old mate, he's supported me for some time and he's just bumped up his pledge to get uh, access to the uh, behind the scenes videos. Thank you very much, mate. Alan DR, thank you very much, Alan, welcome. Sammy M. It's great to have a, uh, another awesome uh, professional uh, artist on the team. Peter E. Another awesome artist has joined us as well. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, thanks for listening to that. Let's get on with the content. Let's go. First off, let's kick off with dry brushing. And uh, I've got a little bit of a different take on it. Let me know what you think. Ah, uh, the charm of opening humbrol tins. I actually do kind of see this as a feature. I do like opening them sometimes, but only if I haven't done it for a long time. Reopening them is a little bit of a chore, but uh, yeah, it, it is what it is. Now for this one, I want a hot, uh, dry brush with humbrols, and there's a really big reason for that. I believe they are one of the best uh, dry brushing paints that I've ever used. It's a combination of the way they dry uh, and the finish that seems to have a, a slight sheen and luster to it that looks different to, uh, to any other paint that I've tried to, to, uh, to dry brush. Now there is quite a downside in working with them. Um, you can see here, mixing these up, you have to be really careful and it's not easy. I haven't used these paints for a couple of months and um, although they're still, you know, they're basically in the same condition as when I, I, I got them from the store, they, um, they do solidify up. You need to give it a really good proper mix and be careful not to, uh, to splash this out. You really, you've got to have one of these electric uh, mixing tools to do a proper job with it. And then you don't even need too much. Just spoon a little bit out onto a, uh, a plastic or uh, a waxed palette like this. And um, a minimum to do, the, uh, to do the job will be fine. These are my two favorite colors for dry brushing if I'm going to use Humbrols. I've got Matte Black 33 and uh, Dark Earth. I think it's, uh, what's the number? Let's check. It's Matte 29. Really important tip, do make sure that you, uh, you know, clean the, uh, the lid and put it back on very carefully because there's nothing worse going back and they've dried out on you. The mechanics of dry brushing are really easy. I mean, load up your brush and then wipe it off. I mean, paint manufacturers must love us doing this, right? But seriously, it works super well because you just want the, uh, the model to do the work. The raised edges of the model will catch the remaining paint that stays on the brush and it's a very time effective way of producing a pleasing result. I try to brush mostly uh, upwards direction for producing a shadow effect and then downwards for producing a highlight. Now getting to questions, I know you're going to ask me why. Why are you dry brushing, Uncle Link? Uh, I thought dry brushing was gone, it was finished, it was retired. Well, yes and no. Uh, I think it's overlooked because it's not cool and when it's overdone uh, and done poorly, it looks terrible. But as you can see with my finished version of this model, it looks alright. I also think that depending on the scale of the model, it becomes more and more a viable technique. The larger the model is, and the, uh, the, the smaller the number of the scale, the closer it gets to the, the, the size of reality, I think dry brushing becomes a more and more viable technique. So for little 1 72nd scale models, uh, I wouldn't do much dry brushing. This is 1 1 12th scale, and uh, I feel that it was a very uh, effective way of, uh, of dealing with some details and bringing the model to life. Next question I know you'd like to ask is why humbrols or why enamel paints for that, re for that matter? And uh, very simple reasons for that. The base paint here is a lacquer paint. So if I were to make any really big mistakes, it would be easily backtrackable, erasable. I could just put a little bit of uh, enamel thinner on the paint. Uh, it won't touch the white paint at all, but it would take off any of the dry brushing mistakes that I made. So it's very uh, foolproof. It's easy to backtrack from my mistakes. It's as easy as doing Control Z, Control Z. The next reason is that uh, the enamels, especially humbrols in this case, take quite a long time to dry, which means that uh, they stay active, alive on your brush for a much longer time, which is super useful. Uh, if I do this with acrylics, it's very hot when I was doing this. Uh, plus 30 degrees Celsius 
and uh, the acrylics dry too quickly and they just uh, gum up the brush very very quickly so um, when I do it with enamels like this I only needed to reload the brush maybe two or three times over the course of this model and they they last longer and they work better so it's a, a trade-off between them but uh, I think that's worth it in this case they require about 24 hours to dry uh, but if you were a little bit desperate, you could then do your acrylic chipping over the top of it and it wouldn't bother it. Again, because of the oil water uh, layering principle, you would uh, your acrylics would not bother with the enamel uh, coat underneath. It's very useful. Please remember, dry brushing must use restraint. Now have a look here. You can see that the dark earth, it's not super apparent. I've used it for a little bit of uh, dirt. Uh, replication simulation and then just catching the edges now here I'm going back with matte black and I'm doing a very uh, light anti highlight a chipping uh, stage with this very lightly dry brushing it on I'm using a flat medium size Tamiya brush and I'm again I'm using the properties of the brush and the model to do most of the work for me with a you know a modicum of control from Uncle Link is happening there too. But again, restraint is super key here. I'm carefully thinking and gradually building it up until I'm pleased with the result. I'm hitting the edges and outlines in a couple of places here. Uh, a few spots, I'll just leave the dark earth and the uh, black is more of a, uh, a finer, if you've done sketching, you'd, where you would do your heavier inking, for example, um, to accentuate the say the shadow or uh, the shadow effects and or just places that would have more uh, more apparent damage that the K2SO would probably bang against himself more or just be more damaged. Um, you can also use it just to accentuate parts of the model that you'd like to stand out more that you've considered you'd like to use as de detail points and uh, I'm doing that here. I did weather the back ever so slightly in a more aggressive way uh, especially that that panel on the bottom there and uh, it was also I was kind of using the back of the model as a bit of a test to see how far I've never done a model of this scale before um, and I've never done a Star Wars model so I was testing this a little bit too to see how I would go with uh, with the Star Wars model and you know so far so good here that's one of the key points I really wanted to emphasize that exact point there in that front chest piece so you can see there, I, uh, I gave that, say, two or three attempts. But then the opposite side to that, I let that go. I completed those dry brushing runs on the rest of the model. And then it's time to kick off with chipping. And uh, as mentioned before, I'll be using acrylics over the top. And in this case, the weather here where I'm based is extreme. We're getting over 30 degrees Celsius every day. So I'm going to be using a wet palette. My paints were just drying so quickly. Here you can see I'm using a, a small piece of sponge. Uh, I've literally, I've torn it off an old bathroom sponge, a cheap one from Woolworths, the supermarket here. Uh, it doesn't need to be a special one at all. And the paints I'm using here are uh, Ammo by Mega Acrylics Chipping and Matte Black. And I mixed, say, a 50-50 uh, combination of them on the wet palette and I'll be using them from here on, just the one color. Again, uh, questions, why? Why then switch to acrylic? Why not continue with enamels? Well, if I make a mistake here, uh, again, I could then use, say, an alcohol-based or water-based thinner to clean off some of the, uh, the chips that I'm producing here, and they would not affect either the enamel paint or the lack of paint underneath. So it's just really, really simple. For some things like this, you know, you and I are in the same situation. We can't afford the, uh, the loss of invested time uh, if we make a, a catastrophic mistake. So I, uh, I don't mind changing medium ever so slightly and just having a couple of these uh, often used paints in a couple of different versions if I know it gives me a bit of a safety net when making and finishing models. Now strategies. As you can probably see by now, I'm building up the effects on this model layer by layer. Uh, the, the, the foundation was the dark earth, then the very light dry brush in different places of, of black, and now the chipping color I'm, uh, I'm using the sponge to produce a randomized effect of very fine scratches and details, but again, exercising a great deal of restraint. The sad thing, these techniques are very powerful, so you want to, you know, as a, as a model, we want to get as much bang for buck as we can out of our time, right? But it's better to go slowly and carefully than to rush too quickly and make mistakes. So take your time and move along. Uh, in a you know in a logical and prudent manner you can always go back and add more taking them off is a little bit more of a pain so just do it like me go along a little bit slowly 
gradually build up your effects. Look to places that would logically be uh, beaten up on the model, but also use it to accentuate areas that you think will look cool. So I've decided to do the left side of that overhanging detail on the back. Uh, try not to be uniform. We often hear uh, talked about that we want to randomize effects, but also try not to do a mirror image of one effect on one side and the same on the other side. Uh, it just seems a little bit unappealing to our brain when we look at it. Make sure that you give both yourself and the people taking the time to view your models a little bit of value for the entertainment that they invest in looking at it. So I like to try to show them different things as they look around my models. Please don't tell anyone. Uncle Link is using a pointy brush. So for some stuff like this, uh, it's good to get in close and do some very fine detail work. Uh, I think this model is a big enough scale that it will uh, benefit from some uh, manually placed chips, uh, manually placed and highlighted. Look at that, I got skills. So um, I'm using exactly the same paint mix. So it's a 50-50 mix or so of um, uh, ammo by MIG uh, chipping color and matte black and uh, mixing them off my uh, wet palette off to the side. Again, doing these painted on chips, it's a very cool process, but restraint is very important. Less is more. So uh, take your time. They need to be randomized uh, and thoughtfully placed. I see some that tend to look like uh, patterns. So if I can tell you, one of the things I think you need to really look out for is uh, don't have it look like there are ants crawling over one of your models. And please avoid the dreaded cross-hatching look for chipping. I see some people, they'll, they'll do them in ways that aren't logically placed so that they're working against each other that would happen. Uh, if, if one process was happening and it's scratching it from a left to right direction, they'll have another scratch that's then doing it from uh, right to left in the opposite direction, giving it a cross-hatched effect. And instead of breaking it up and being a randomized process, uh, it ends up actually forcing our eye to look into it, makes it uncomfortable, uh, it looks contrived, and uh, it immediately breaks the illusion. And that's what we want from this. It's a suspension of disbelief. We want to believe that this is real. We want to. When we look at models, we really want to believe. We want to believe. So um, keeping that suspension of disbelief is very important. And it's our job as artists to provide that for our viewer. You'll notice here too that I wasn't shy of using the uh, the flat flatter edge of the uh, of the round brush to uh, to augment and accentuate some uh, some of the curved places inside the model there. Then switch back to the uh, spotting in of details, and I'm layering up. You can see those dark earth. Uh, they're more like scuff marks rather than chips, right? Some of them will then benefit from having a darker center to give it a little bit more apparent depth. I'm letting this roll in real time because I wanted to give you an idea of the thought process. You can see I'm pouring over the model, carefully looking it over and planning these. I'm not just rushing into it. And um, now I've done that. You, as you guys would know, I've been doing this for, for quite a few years and uh, at the professional level, I know what I'm doing, right? But I'm still not rushing into it. I'm having a really good look over this and I'm carefully, very strategically thinking about where to place my chips. Um, so don't beat yourself up. Please take your time and think it through. Some places benefit from a different shape. So uh, the scratch marks are good. Uh, you can streak them in, but also dotting them in to give it that jagged appearance as if he's rubbed up against something and it's really slightly torn into his side there. And then back to accentuating the shadow effect on the, uh, the back uh, inside part of the uh, of the main armor piece. Uh, before we put those uh, the shoulder parts back in, it's better to uh, access it now while they're off. Next up, let's do some panel lining. Now, panel lining is a way to add some uh, shade and uh, shadow effects and some depth to the model, and it really bumps up the uh, the amount of visual detail. I've used three products here. Well, it's one product with three shades. Uh, they're from Citadel. One of them is Non Oil, which is a uh, dark brown, black shade. In the middle, I've got, uh, what is it? It's called uh, Agrax Earth, I believe. Uh, Agrax Earth Shade. And then uh, the lightest one I used was uh, Seraphim Sepia Shade. And um, simply put, I went with uh, the darkest one, Nuln Oil, in the, uh, the darker crevices here, darker lines. Um, I used Agrax for the medium ones, and then the Seraphim 
for uh, simulated rust effects there, like on the um, back of the, uh, the lower shin there, middle shin, that you can see there. Now, why? Why did I go with uh, acrylic products for a change? A couple of reasons. Uh, I wanted to, for fun. Uh, it, was, it was lovely to sit around inside and I had the wet palette out. So it kept these products uh, open, uh, stopped it from drying out as quickly as they usually would. And um, the other reason is uh, Bandai plastics can be susceptible to enamel spirits. So uh, I often use a lot of uh, enamel washes on models and uh, Bandai plastic can be, uh, it can go brittle, it can crack. Uh, different it can have different challenges with it now I haven't had a you know knock on wood I haven't had any bad luck so far but I've been very careful uh, painting the plastic seems to protect them a great deal um, uh, priming them various ways that you can coat and cover the plastic so that the uh, the enamel thinners don't go straight into it um, you can also use naphtha based products um, say Zippo lighter fluid for example is uh, something like that uh, and because it dries off very quickly, it doesn't give it enough time to, uh, to damage the plastic. And one of the reasons it damages the plastic, see thumbs, thumbs are real. You can use thumbs. One of the reasons it uh, has some challenges is Bandai's engineering is very sophisticated. Um, some of these uh, seam lines, I didn't glue them. Uh, this is a snap fit kit, so I've just pressed it together. So some of them aren't sealed properly. Uh, well, when I say properly, they just didn't need it. I zinged it together super quick, as you can see in the build video. Um, and they're very thin. Uh, K2SO is a skinny dude, so um, his limbs are very, very thin. So uh, the chances of the thinner getting inside and wreaking havoc is, as K2SO would say, the odds are high, very high. So putting all of those things together, I decided Let's, uh, let's go with some acrylic weathering, see if I can get a pleasant effect with it. And uh, that will be something that uh, I can use when it's both very hot and I've got the aircon on with the wet palette. And also when it's very cold. Not that it gets very cold where I am. Some of you guys live in real cold, so I know you're kind of probably laughing at me now. But uh, I think it's something I want to increase my repertoire of skills and product usage so that uh, I can share things with you guys that will be more useful for you for people who don't live in uh, climates like myself. So for friends who live in the very uh, far north, uh, some of these products and uh, tips and strategies will be very helpful for you. Here's a really good example of, uh, here's the right leg and uh, I'm going to be addressing the, uh, the panel line that's just above his knee here. So first of all, I'm going in with Nuln Oil. Uh, it's a deep uh, panel line, so I'm going in with my darkest color. I've got it thinned ever so slightly with water. But you can use it straight out of the, uh, the pot. It's, uh, it's lovely stuff. I believe these shade products, they behave like an ink with a small amount of uh, flat medium added to them. The, uh, yes, you could probably make that yourself, but um, the convenience of using these uh, Citadel products is, is very high. It's very easy to use. So going all the way around, neatness is uh, somewhat of a virtue here. You can streak out some of the product if it overlaps a little bit, um, but the working time is very short, especially when it's very hot where I am now. So I uh, put it in with a very sharp pointy brush. Any parts that I think are a little overdone, I'll quickly wipe them off with, the, uh, with a clean brush. And um, within minutes it's dry, and then you can go for additional subsequent um, uh, detail effects. So now changing up, going with Agrax, I've got to get these names right, Agrax Earthshade into uh, some of the, uh, the lighter uh, joints here. And um, now I'm using, you can see that that's the very reddish effect, that's seraphim, uh, sepia, to, uh, to simulate, I wouldn't say it's exactly rust, but the tone I'm looking for is somewhere between the extremes. I've got black on this, I've got white, I've got orange, which is kind of in the middle. So I wanted to go with yellowish tones uh, for the weathering. And to give it a, an idea of uh, Tatooine, you know that yellowish kind of earth effect that they have there? Something like that. And I think this looks really cool. K2SO doesn't have a lot of uh, horizontal real estate, but he's all about the vertical, right? So I've carried that feature down the leg here, again with more of this uh, seraphim, sepia shade, to, uh, to give it some, a little bit of life. Uh, black and white is a really cool scheme, but you need just that little bit of extra color to bring it to life. You can see here it uh, shades, it streaks very nicely as well. I dip the, uh, the brush in water. I'm just going to, to clean 
spread it out and, uh, and move it down here. And uh, yeah, I, I quite like how this stuff works. Too easy and no fumes. Love it. If you like that, you'll love the advanced weathering guide available now to my patron supporters. I get my Star Wars kits, paints, and tools from my local hobby shop, Hobbyco. And let's do our part, support local, and check them out. If you're also in Australia, get your local hobby shop to contact Ryan at Hobbyco and they will get Star Wars in for you. Cool, right? Huge shout out to my top patron supporters, Ivan, MB, Grant, Con, Simon, and Robert. Thanks, guys. And an extra special shout out to the Paint on Plastic patron community who make these videos happen. Thanks, guys.